I have, a, I have a few things from Rabbi Nachman that I'd like to share. Um, but first, a comment on what Safa was saying about, um, about standing for the elderly. Now, I know the halakha is to literally stand up for them, and I do believe that that, that is what we're supposed to do, um, and, what, and that's a correct interpretation of the Torah. But um, I think it really needs to go beyond that, because when we stand for them, it means we're saying we respect you. You know, it's not just we have to stand up. Oh, stand up. Okay, let's just stand up. Then I can sit down again. We should think about why we're standing up. We're standing up because we're saying the elderly among us have been number one blessed to reach that age. You know that there's some merit in there, um, and that they have attained a level of wisdom that we have not. It doesn't matter how high your IQ is or how good your grades are in school, you do not have the kind of wisdom that a person with gray hair has. And you can never get that wisdom until, um, until you've experienced that many years of life and hardship and loss and sorrow and victory, you know, all those things. And another thing I think that, 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 um, that tells us, you know, standing for them, there's, there's just literally standing, but the word stand also means to um, be strong in your resolve for a cause. So if you stand for Israel, that means you love and support and defend and want the best for Israel, right? And so same thing with um, with 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 the elderly. When you when you stand for them, it, you should be standing for them literally and physically, but it should mean something deeper which means that you care about them, you honor them, you respect them, you value them. Um, you know, in the temple services, um, when you're younger, you, you, you're, you're, you serve, you actually serve in the temple. When you're older, you don't serve anymore, but you become um, a counselor of so sorts to the younger uh, men serving in the temple. So there's still a lot of value. And I, I don't remember who it was, but I, I think it was a Kabbalistic quote. I don't remember who said this, but it said that um, a society is judged by the way it treats the weakest among us, which is number one, the elderly, and then number two, small helpless children. So how do we how how do we treat those two classes of people? That shows whether we are truly righteous or not. Okay, um, and then. Rabbi Nachman on uh, chapter 19, verse 2 of Kedoshim, where it says, speak to the entire Israelite community and say to them, be holy because I, God your Lord, am holy. He says that, well, actually, the Midrash Rabbah says that holiness may be found wherever there is a safeguard against moral immorality. And Rabbi Nachman says that a person must guard his covenant. Should he fail to do so, he'll be counted among the immoral, the idolaters. Now, um, uh, Rav Ravan was talking about rebuking people. And I think that all the rabbinic safeguards that we have in Judaism, sometimes to me, they seem petty, especially to argue about. Um, however, it's so much better that we're arguing over those things, over rabbinic laws, than actually arguing over true Torah sin. And I think that's the whole point of all the rabbinic safeguards, the rabbinic laws, the chumras, um, the halakot that aren't specifically mentioned in the Torah. Because if we're worried about violating things at that level, then we will never get close to violating the actual Torah. And that's the whole point of those rabbinic laws. Um, so, for example, you know, of course, we know we're not supposed to commit adultery. Um, there's also fornication is not allowed. But in Judaism, you're not even supposed to um, be in the same room alone or even, I think, even the same house alone um, with someone who is not your family member and that it would be immoral to have sexual relations with them. So that is, um, that's a safeguard. And it's a lot easier to rebuke someone and say, hey, you shouldn't, it's not proper to be alone with that man in that house than to say, hey, you shouldn't commit adultery with him, right? One is easier to approach someone about. 
So sometimes, you know, we we argue, especially like on Passover or something about, oh, you know, we don't have to do that. We should be doing this, blah, blah, blah. And that's good. At least we're not arguing about, hey, stop eating pizza on, on, on you know, the piece of unleavened bread. Okay, that's a better argument to have. So um, anyway, so Rabbi Nachman, he talks about how, you know, in the Midrash Shabbat says that you're, you're, there's holiness when you're safeguarding immorality. And I believe that's what these rabbinic laws are. Um, there's another one, but now I forgot. Okay, I'll go on. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, in 19 verse 4, it says, do not turn to the idols or make molten gods for yourselves. I am God, your Lord. Okay, now I remember. Okay, about the safeguard. Um, there's a lot of things that Hashem gives to us, which are not like, you know, Ruben was saying, they're not about immorality. You know, they're not about wrong or right. It's just, it's, it's only wrong or right. If you're a Jew, like keeping Shabbat, eating kosher, you know, if a non-Jew eats pork, technically they are not sinning because they have not entered into that covenant. That doesn't mean that they can't reap benefits of eating a, a kosher clean diet, but um, it's still, it's not technically sin to them, according to Judaism, according to um, Jewish law. Um, but however, it serves as a way to, to, to keep us away from certain people, certain groups, certain settings. So if we have to keep Shabbat, we're not going to take certain occupations. If we're eating kosher, we will stay away from certain restaurants. If we can't participate in idolatry, we'll stay away from certain types of events. If we're not supposed to, if we're supposed to be pure sexually, we'll stay away from certain parties and people and friends, et cetera. And that's exactly what they're intended to do. You know, we're, God wants us to not enter into certain situations. And this is partly why he gave us laws, even the ones that we don't understand. Um, we can at least understand that when we keep these strange laws, there's a lot of people that don't want to be around us because they just think we're too weird. And that's what that's what they're meant to do. That's partly what they're meant to do, to keep us away from potential potentially evil um, situations, sinful situations. Okay. Do not turn yourself, do not turn to the idols or make molten gods for yourselves. I'm God, your Lord, 19.4. Um, the Zohar says that idols here alludes to adultery and other sins of lasciviousness. When Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai saw something that could be construed as sexual immorality, he would quote that verse, do not turn to the idols or make molten gods for yourselves. Now, um, I heard, you know, sometimes people say, oh, it's only idolatry when you bow down to an idol. And that's not true. It's not true according to Kabbalah. It's not true according to the breakdown of the Aseret Hadibrot, the Ten Commandments, according to Judaism. According to Judaism, the first commandment is, I am, I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of house of bondage. And, um, you know, believers in Yeshua can apply that, even if they're not Jewish, they can apply that to, to um, Hashem bringing us out of bondage to sin, right, through Yeshua. But number two, it doesn't start out with do not make idols. Number two starts out with have no other Elohim, have no other mighty ones before me. Let nothing in your life be stronger and mightier than me, than my words, than my ways, than my commandments. So in that way, even if you're not talking about a literal physical idol, it can still be idolatry. So I think that for me, I think that that makes it um, like non-negotiable idolatry. Maybe it's maybe it's not idolatry, but it's still a violation of don't have any other gods because mighty ones, a mighty one can be anything that you put as more important than Hashem. Um, and he goes on to say about that verse, this verse implies that a person must avoid immoral thoughts. In general, committing adultery is akin to serving idols. Okay. Mm, how do I get rid of these things? Uh, Giovis, can you get rid of those? Thank you. Very good. Okay. <laughs> and then, um, let me see. 19.9, I think this is also interesting. Um, when he, when Ruby Nachman uh, comments on chapter 19, verse 9, where it says, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not completely reap the corner of your field. Also, do not pick up the gleanings from your harvest. Um, and now, the, it says in Pe'ah, um, pretty sure that's Mishnah, Talmud or Mishnah. 
uh, Mishnah, or uh, if not, at least Talmud. It says these things do not have a fixed amount. The pe'a, which is that one must leave over for the poor a corner of his field during the harvest. Um, the bikurim, the first fruits of each season, which are given to the Kohen. And the ra'ayon, that's sent to Jerusalem during the three festivals. All of these gifts are charitable acts and represent the first charity, the beginning of one's giving to charity. Um, so, um, uh, tithe is measured, right? The tithe is a tenth. It's literally like what it means. But there are certain types of offerings that we can give without measure. Also, certain offerings to the temple. Besides tithe, we can give a Thanksgiving offering anytime we want. Um, and so, you know, we we can be um, the tithe is 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 a minimum, right? but beyond that, there is there's also these other um, these other types of Thanksgiving offerings and first fruit offerings and stuff like that. Now, the actual tithe um, from that's commanded in Torah was to go to support the um, Levitical priesthood. Priesthood. We don't have that specific tithe anymore, but there's still the tithe for the poor, which um, Yeshua said, you will always have the poor among you. And um, we still still celebrate the holy days. So I believe that we should um, also be saving up for our um, feast, our um, you know ho holy day tithe. And there's also the tithe that Abraham gave and that was before the Torah was given on Sinai. He gave a tenth of everything he had to Melchit Sedek. Um, so, you know, supporting uh, outreaches, I don't want to say ministries, it's, it's not a very welcome word in uh, Judaism. They think that you're a Christian if you say the word ministry. So I'll call it outreach. When you, call, when you support certain types of outreach, um, you know, B'nai Avraham, Israel 365, Chabad.org, um, you know, rabbis that you learn from, et cetera. When, when you're giving sadaka to, to those types of um, outreaches, then you're giving a kind of tithe, not, not the Levitical tithe, that would be, that, that's a sur to say, oh, I'm giving my Levitical tithe to these people. We cannot accept Levitical tithe. The, when you give that kind of tithe, we, we're giving more of like an Avrahamic tithe, the kind of tithe that um, Avraham gave to Melchizedek. That's it.